My name is Melissa Norris. I publish Fish Alaska and Hunt Alaska magazines. We are here today to discuss the King Salmon Run on the Nushagek River in Southwest Alaska. Our agenda is to identify concerns along with solutions that are being considered now and to see if we can add to the ideas to the mix. I'm joined in this discussion by my associates, several of my friends who own lodges and fishing guide businesses on the Nushagek River and folks from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game who have a bird's eye view into the area's management. For those who are not familiar with the Nush, the Nushagek River originates in the Alaska Range and concludes in Nushagek Bay, an inlet of Bristol Bay. One thing that is special about this some um, 280 mile Nushagek is that it is home to the world's largest remaining wild king salmon run. However, a run that has traditionally seen an average of over 100,000 Chinook each year is being counted at less than half in the last couple of seasons. It's no secret that king salmon fishing has seen a major downturn over the last couple of decades, but for the most part, the Nush has held strong. Does that mean it is a regional issue, part of a larger ocean influence problem, or a combination of factors? That's all part of what we are here to discuss. I've personally fished on this river for over 15 years, and there's a distinct difference today in the number and size of the River Chinook, as these folks who are joining me today can also attest. Our goal is to conserve what we still have. So now we'll begin by inviting our panel to introduce themselves, starting with Lee Borden. Uh, good morning, uh, my name is Lee Borden. I'm with the Department of Fish and Game. I am the Division of Sport Fish Area Management Biologist. Um, I've been on the Nushagak for four seasons. This will be my fifth going into this summer. Thank you. <clears throat> Tim? Good morning, my name is Tim Sands. I am the with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Commercial Fisheries. I'm the Area Management Biologist. I started here in Dillingham in 20, 2000, the year 2000, I started as the air assistant uh, and I became the area management biologist in 2002 and I'm in that same position today. So I've been here for 20 years. Great. Jason. Well, good morning, everyone. I think I know most of you. Um, I. My name is Jason Dye and I'm the uh, regional management biologist with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Sport Fish. Um, I've been in this job about a year and my current duties still include supervising the area management biologist in Bristol Bay. So I still have my fingers in Bristol Bay stuff. Um, as most of you probably know, I spent 16 years as the area management biologist in Bristol Bay for the division of sport fish and a total of 23 years in Bristol Bay. And I've personally fish the new Shigak probably 25 consecutive years now. So um, I've been around a while and, and seen a lot of changes on the new Shigak. Thank you. And Rob. Good morning. Uh, this is, I'm Rob Fuentes. I've, uh, we have Alaska's Bear Claw Lodge and Alaska Kingfishers. And uh, we've been out there, I've been out there since about 2002. Um, Kingfishers was originally owned and operated with Kratzer, and I think that's been around since the late 80s, and uh, so um, he's not here to speak for his uh, part, but we took over Kingfishers back in uh, 13, and, uh, but uh, we've, we've fished the system ever since we've been in the area, and, and it's no better place in the world, so we want to do what we can to protect it. Thank you, Rob. Pete? Well, good morning. This is Pete Von Jess. I own the uh, Nushagak River Adventures Lodge, and I'm in the backyard of uh, Rob Fuentes on the island. I uh, really appreciate you inviting us to the discussion this morning, Melissa, and I'm really happy that uh, the government is with us to make this a great discussion. I've had the camp from uh, 2017 until present. Uh, and I fished there as a client for uh, four years before that. So slightly less than 10 years uh, on the river watching it do its thing. Uh, before that, I was over on the Kenai as a client watching that river uh, deteriorate in the same kind of manner. So uh, I'm really looking forward to having a great discussion about figuring out ways that we can make this river survive uh, with all the adversity around us from pebble to all the other factors. And I look forward to talking with y'all. 
Thanks, Pete. Justin? Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Justin Crump, and uh, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, I uh, have been going to Bristol Bay since I was in high school in the early 2000s, or I guess late, I guess my first year there was 1999, and then I end up uh, getting to know uh, Tim and Jason here in the early 2000s when I worked in the commercial fishing industry. And since then, I uh, became a fishing guide uh, working for a uh, lodge on the Knack River, uh, Bear Trail Lodge. And then for the last six years, I've had uh, my own guide business with uh, my wife called Brigade Adventure Travel. And we have a little camp on the Nishigak um, and we spend the summer there. So got a little bit of time in the area and uh, yeah, really happy to be here to talk to you all about Nishigak, and it's good to see everyone's face this morning. Thank you, Bob. Klontz, please. Hey, good morning, Bob Klontz. Um, I think the first time, I, and thank because my my memories were fail, failing. First time I put a line in the Nishigak was 1983. Um, subsequently, been there every year since then. Um, we have a camp upriver, up above the Iowithla, um, about eight miles. Um, I, in the last couple of years, I've been involved with the Nishigak Advisory Council, working with um, uh, uh, Jeff Regnart and Tom Brookover and Michael Link from BBSRI. And they're, we've been working on this problem. Act I've talked to Rob quite a few times about it. I'm working on this problem actively. I, I can bring the solutions that are being discussed now to the table in a little while. And the most important thing is we're looking for other solutions that to, to make a board recommendation in the future. Thank you, Bob. And thank you all for being here and taking time out of your schedule, appreciate it. So we're gonna begin, our first question is just kind of asking um, folks to give us a general historical use perspective from each of the user groups. Who are these user groups? And so, um, I'll ask Tim Lee or Jason to answer that for us to begin with. I'll, I'll go first. Um, so we'll start with subsistence. Uh, subsistence in Alaska law has the highest priority use. So everything else has to be closed before subsistence is restricted. And as they, the local folks here like to say, they've been subsistence fishing on the Nushigak for 10,000 years. Um, there's a any Alaska resident can subsistence fish and, and there's, you know, quite a bit of subsistence fishing in the early June uh, The targets Kings. I think the average harvest is in 12 to 14,000 range. Uh, commercial fishing started here in the Nishigak district in 1884. So it's been going on for quite some time as well. And there's two gear types, uh, drift gill net and set gill net that fish in, in Bristol Bay. Um, and you know, the, the, it's primarily a sockeye salmon fishery. There are times we have directed king openings and there's times we have, uh, mesh restrictions for, to protect, you should get, protect king salmon. So we restrict mesh to five and a half inch mesh or smaller. Um, but that's, I guess that's the basics of the commercial fishery and the subsistence fishery. Do you want to speak on sport behalf, Jason or Lee? Yeah, I'll go ahead and jump in. So, um, you know, the, the Nushigak uh, sport fishing industry has been actively managed since the early 90s. Um, there was a season put in place in 1990, and then the King Salmon Management Plan was put into place in 1992. So um, it's undergone a few changes and revisions since then, but uh, active management has been in place since that time. Um, the fishery on average, the long-term average from uh, you know, about that time of active management from 89 to 17, that long-term average was about 6,000 harvest in the sport fishery. Um, it's had a slight recent uptick. So if you do a recent five-year average, it's at about 7,000. Um, I mean, that shows that the fishery has been relatively stable as far as harvest goes for you know, the past 20 plus years since you know, the 90s. And so, um, the you know average harvest above and below sonar are about uh, just shy of four thousand above the sonar and around three thousand below the sonar. Um, 
and right now it seems to be a, a pretty stable fishery. Um, we've recently done a catch and release uh, mortality study and we found that catch and release mortality is about 6.7% um, through all gear types. So um, that's just kind of a brief snapshot of the fishery, a little bit of history. I don't know if Jason wants to jump in and fill in any holes I might've left there or not. No, thanks, Lee. I, I don't have much to add other than, you know, the, the long-term averages in harvest are stable, but there has been some pretty significant variability between years, um, particularly in years that were heavy, heavily restricted and years that the run was way down. So um, there has been some variability in harvest. And, but like Lee said, over time, that's been, that's been fairly stable, although you know harvest is not necessarily indicative of, of run size because people typically still reach their their limits. That's about it. There just isn't that much sport fish pressure on this river in particular, due to its nature of remoteness. Well, I would say that's debatable. Uh, uh, how much effort it you know for Bristol Bay, it's high effort fishery. Um, but yeah, in the big picture, it's not, it's not particularly high effort, but that's changed over time and, and, you know, how that fishery is kind of how, how that fishery, um, kind of goes through the season in terms of where people are fishing and how the, how there may be crowding occurring and, and those types of things have, have changed over time and can change from season to season as any of these guys can kind of attest to. So, um, Rob Fuentes. Can you tell me a little bit about sort of like what you picture as the heyday of the sport fishing over the last uh, decade? Yeah, you know, um, so my first camp was up there on the Nuyakuk and then I moved down below Equok and then I moved down to the current location, which is just above Portis Creek on the West Parade. And um, over the years, of course, upriver, anything above the split where it comes back together, there's just not that much pressure in comparison to downriver. I actually think from what I recall, there's less camps on the river now than there was, let's just say maybe 10 years ago. Um, there was a time, I think it was around seven or eight where we had just some really hard times economically. And I think a lot of camps went out in that time frame. And, but before there, I, I seem to recall considerable camps. I tried to get some data from Chogue to see if they had a, a current number the, of registered camps that are active, but I couldn't get them to get, uh, get back in touch with me. But I would guesstimate it's around 40 to 50 camps. About five to eight are large, kind of like kingfishers and fish the noose, maybe, maybe five. And, and then the rest of them, you know, are kind of anywhere from small to, to in between. Um, so as far as kind of a heyday period, I actually think there was more pressure uh, a few years back, and uh, but that that changes from year to year. People come and go all the time. Thank you. So, and I I would add that that and I'm sure everyone knows this, but 2020 was kind of an anomaly because of COVID. There, you know, I spent some time on the river, and it was, you know, effort was down significantly. I I would <laughs> I think it would be safe to say well under half normal levels. So. I think that that is 100% true everywhere. <laughs> well, maybe yeah. not so much on the peninsula I, here, but. And I can reiterate that too. I went up and did a count and we had creeled the river in 2018, had a crew out there and I'd counted the same sublocations myself personally this last season in, in 20. And I counted 20% of the effort on the same day as the previous year. So that's a one day snapshot. But I mean, on that one day, which was right at the very end of June, which is normally a very busy time, it was 20% of what we would normally see, you know, based on previous years. Yeah. Pete, you have something to add? Yeah, no, actually just a question. Uh, if, if the average of sport fishing is uh, six to 7,000 uh, kings taken each year, what do you think it, it would have been this last year when there were only maybe two or three outfits up there uh, and mostly they were supporting the Alaskan uh, people, residents. Is it? Well, like we didn't open up. We shut down because of this thing, which is too hard. We went up there ourselves to do some construction, you guys know, but um, when we were out, uh, I think, um, I don't know who's downriver? Um, 
Ken Anderson was around. Yeah, he was around, but uh, more so the one down. Jake's. Uh, Jake's was around, yeah. Jake's was down. Jake's uh, salmon camp. They were the predominant uh, camp on the river in the big scheme of things. So what do you think the, you know, when we saw the numbers for, for this run, it seemed like it was even less than other years, but is that because the sonar wasn't out and you just didn't get, you didn't count them? Or where do you think no. the numbers were truly down? I, it, I think the numbers were truly down. I mean, all indications were that the numbers were down. The sonar counters were in and counting as they normally do. Um, you know, the other, other indicators this last season, the, the subsistence harvest to some degree, but especially the commercial catch of kings during the sockeye fishery was way down. It was, it was well below average. Um, so I think the run was certainly a small, it was a small run. Um, where exactly that falls historically, I don't know, but I, I, I do know that sport harvest will be, I, my guess would be well under half. I, I would hate to try to guess a number, but it's going to be, you know, between effort being down and the run being down, um, we're going to see probably one of the lowest sport harvests on record. Can, and can I ask a follow-up, even though it may be out of sequence? Sure. So, If you, if you do some math, uh, you guys do math all the time with these fish, they hatch. So, so this year's 2020, we're talking about 2020. So 2020's low number goes back to some other number before some other year before this, right? When they actually harvest, uh, uh, when they actually, uh, were, uh, bred. So what year would that have been? Five years? Five years prior? It's typically going to be three to four, up to five years. Yeah, it's a window. Some fish come back at, you know, even jacks are, you know, one or two years in ocean. So anywhere for up to five or six years for some of those large fish, but the average would be three to four years. Okay. So, so, so unfortunately, you years. can't go back to a single year for kings because they're multiple, they're coming back in multiple age classes. Mm -hmm. so, so let's just pretend it's four years just to put a number. So that would have put it in 2016. These fish were 2016 fish. Is there any uh, utility about that 2016 run that was uh, would cause it to be lower this year, you think? No, Tim says no. No, so, 2016, we made the goal. So go ahead, Tim, sorry. So the way it works is uh, the, the different age classes, you know, typically you'll see one twos, one threes, one fours on Nishigak, occasionally a one five. A one two is a four year old fish, one year in freshwater, two years in the ocean, and one year as an egg. So if it's a one two, it came back in 2020, it went, it, its parents came into the river in 2016. Um, so yeah, 2016, we had 125,000 escapement by the counter. Um, so that, that was a really strong year. What, what factors affect the survival of those fish um, going, there's, there's freshwater factors. If it's a high water year and the eggs are washed out, if it's uh, when they're rearing, if it's high water, maybe they're, they're forced off the main channel into side channels where it's not as good a feeding. Um, our data indicates that for Nushigak River King salmon, there is density dependent mortality. So if we have too much escapement, it can be a bad thing. So you, you think about the early 2000s when we had those huge escapements, 2004, 2005, we didn't get very good returns off those years. Then there's the ocean. And, and as Melissa said at the start of this, statewide King salmon have not been doing very well. The new Shigak actually has fared better than a lot of systems around the state. And so that points to ocean conditions that are not as favorable for king salmon survival right now. And is it is it one of those things that that changes over time? You know, the PDO people talk about or the Aleutian Low Pressure Index? Uh, or is it just climate change in general that is making the ocean a little bit less hospitable for kings or or is it competition from 
farmed or, or, or uh, hatchery fish from all over the place. There's, it's just too big a black box to know what the answer is. But there's probably not one answer. There's probably, there's probably contributing exactly. factors from all user groups. And so really the, the best outcome is to figure out what each user group can do and get everyone on board, which will be a really easy, easy trick. You got this. And then, um, you know, then you'll see some real change. So I do want you to get more into the ocean condition discussion at some point here when we're ready to proceed to that, which maybe now. Can you talk to us about, so we all agree, okay. You're talking about the statewide and the ocean conditions and, and all of these things that I truly believe and can see from the level where I sit. However, what does that, how, why are the last two years on the NUSH so poor when it has traditionally fared so strongly throughout all of this? And the ocean condition problem isn't new. The King downturn isn't new. We're five or six or seven years into it in Southeast, if not longer, right? So, you know, presumably we have similar factors and then also different factors in each region, right? Yeah, right. So the, you know, we just sat in on a talk that was directed at King Salmon, but it was, uh, they looked at a lot of the climate stuff and, and the, you know, they've had this blob, you've all heard of the blob, this mm -hmm. massive warm water in the Gulf of Alaska that uh, really the Chignik sockeye salmon run has failed for several years. Uh, Copper River sockeye has done very poorly. And some other other sockeye runs down down south have done poorly, whereas Bristol Bay, the Nushigak itself, has had the biggest sockeye runs ever. And we're we're in Bristol Bay in total. We're like six years in a row over fifty million total return of sockeye to Bristol Bay. It's off the charts. So, so these where it could be bad for down south it could be good for the Bering Sea it, 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 and it could it could also be these freshwater uh, influences where a particular winter of either really low water can can make a difference or a really high water in this you know when the fish are rearing um you know if 2019, you talk about the last two years of, of Nushigak King salmon. And I, I didn't know if we were jumping on to number three yet or not. I was going to talk about the calendars. I, yeah. I don't, you know, we'll I'm going to just go ahead with that. Whenever you're whenever you feel it flows with what your point you want to make. All right. Yeah. So so um the, the counters we have, we, so on the Nushigak, we use sonar to count salmon. And we're counting fish, and then we have to apportion those fish into different species. Um, the sonar was designed to count sockeye salmon. It's not designed to count kings. We don't count across the whole river. We count on each side of the river. We have basically four sonars, two on each side of the river, and they count about 30 meters on each side of the river. Um, and the river is, what, 100 meters across or something? So, so we're missing a big chunk in the middle of the river. And king salmon are much more inclined to be more mid-channel than sockeye, which are very strongly bank-oriented. There's also a, a significant chum run there. So our sonar counts the sockeye, counts the fish, and then our crew apportions that fish into species based on these test fishing drifts. Now, if there's a year like 2017, when we had a record number of sockeye come back, over 2.8 million sockeye went up to Nushigak. Is it possible that our, our ability to apportion 100,000 kings out of 2.8 million sockeye is hampered? Well, yeah, I mean, it, 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 the math doesn't work the same when there's that many sockeye around. Mm. Um, 2019, we had really low water. And in other years, we, we've done some studies where we're, we look at 
how many what percentage of the king salmon go through the ensomified zone, the area we're counting. And we we didn't do those studies for long enough, but we did them for what we had money for. And the studies show that in years of low water, the kings tend to be more in the middle and outside the ensomified zone. So we're working on it. We're trying, kings have been an afterthought for years. Like I said, the we, we started counting with sonar in 1980. The sonar was designed specifically for sockeye, but we, we tried to count kings and, and manage kings. But as Lee said, there wasn't even a management plan for kings until 1992. And it, it really has just been a secondary consideration because sockeye have driven the management of the Bristol Bay fishery. That's where the money is. And, you know, I, I don't know what else to say. It, it's not the way I want it to be, but it's the way it is. And even now, you know, we're getting over $800,000 a year from industry to manage the Bristol Bay fishery. The state's not paying for all the management. Industry is, is putting in a 20, 25% of our money to help us manage the Bristol Bay fishery. And a lot of that money is, you know, goes to the sonar camp and, and other things. Um, so it's, it's a really complex, complicated issue. I also wanted to say, I, I sent you that table, Melissa. Um, I don't know if you shared it with everybody or else or not. But as I said, that table is preliminary. And, and one of the things that's very, really preliminary on it is the 2020 numbers, especially the sport fish number, that's a, a five-year average. That's, you know, the sport fish gets their, they do their mail out survey. And so they won't have a, a good number for 2020 until next year. So we just use the five-year average on that. And, and the subsistence number is they're still collecting subsistence permits from 2020. So that's not a, a solid number either. Do you have any kind of a, a small out migration data to compare to sonar information to get a better understanding of what's happening in the river versus the ocean? You're shaking your head no. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. I mean, uh, you know, uh, there are other places in the state they do small stuff. Uh, I worked out in the Southeast and they did big king coated wire tagging projects where they would go out and trap out migrating king salmon and do coated wire tags into them and then do these big capture projects when they returned where they could do total population estimates. Um, the, the king run on the Nushigak is way bigger than anything they have in Southeast and to effectively do a project like that would take literally millions of dollars. Um, we, you know, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do a genetic mark recapture study where if we can, if we can determine genetic markers for individual stocks, say, say that Kaltuli or the King Salmon or, or a couple of tributaries to the Nushigak, if we could say, if we could catch a fish at Portage Creek and say, well, that's a cocktooly fish and then we could put a weir up on the cocktooly and count all those kings going up the cocktooly then we could figure out what the whole population is on the new Chicago. and we, we do a much better job of managing it we're working right now on this what we call a run reconstruction model and i'm not the expert on it but basically it incorporates more data it incorporates the sonar data it incorporates aerial survey data. We're trying to bring back aerial surveys so we can kind of ground truth our, our sonar count for years like 2019 when we felt that there were maybe more kings around than the sonar counted. Um, another piece of data that, that would honestly be helpful is sport fishing catch per unit effort data. Uh, if I could get daily data from sport camps that said, this is how many rod hours we fished. This is how many fish we, we caught. If we built a database like that in 10 or 15 years, we could look at that data and say, hey, man, the sport fishing is way better today than the sonar count indicates. Maybe there's something wrong with the sonar count today or this year. And maybe it's low water or maybe it's um, something something else, you know, more sockeye or more chum, or maybe the sonar is not functioning properly. Um, but there's, we're just trying to figure it out. We finally got money to 
to pay attention to kings that we, we never really had before. And so we're starting to learn from almost the beginning. Rob, do you want to ask something? I do, I do. And and Tim, thank you. Uh, you know, we always appreciate you guys and Jason and Lee, just because I know many times y'all's job is terribly not easy and uh, hands are tied many times, but um, I appreciate the candidate response because uh, as far as sonar data, uh, yeah, we always question those just, you know, even with, with before they changed it, didn't they change it three or four years ago? Um, so, so we had the Bendix was our original sonar. And then they developed this new sonar ca called Didson, and they switched that in the early 2000s. Like, I think there was a little side-by-side -side counting, 2004, 2005, and then I think by 2007, it was all Didson, um, because the Bendix, the guy who invented that was the only guy who really knew how to maintain it and repair it, and, and unfortunately, he, he passed away, so we were forced to this other system. Yeah. Yeah, and so we would always, we kind of got used to at first the old system because we would always compare because we always logged in, got the information, just just being proactive from a sport fishing standpoint, know what to anticipate with the run. And we would compare it to, as we discussed at the end of the day, what we caught, how the fishing was. So we got used to the old system where if it said there was 4,000 fish, we knew it was going to be a pretty good day. The new system has been for us, at least using it as a tool, a comparison, has, uh, has been very inconsistent. And the reason being, there was many times where it said only 300 fish came through, but yet collectively with our, just our camp, we know we landed that many between all the boats that were out there. So I, I would speak for myself, but I, I would feel comfortable for any other sport fishing lodge. Absolutely, we would be available and be happy to participate in any data capture that helped facilitate that because I know using the counters as it is, is better than having no counters, but since what's being out there is used to manage what we're able to do, well, we need to make that data as good as it can be because, you know, typically we feel we get impacted first or the most or the hardest on one, on one aspect. And so if our data can help say, oh, well, the run says 300, but between all these camps, they all caught a lot of fish. So what, how do we make an adjustment for that day or for whatever? Um, I, I think I think every normal camp would be happy to participate in something like that. All right. Well, well I'll, I'll work with Lee to get that kind of uh, get a voluntary system in place, just to to try it for a few years and, and see how it goes. Funding has a direct impact on on you know the efforts made, of course, and the goals, and then the outcome. Just one more thing about that. I don't know if this is totally relevant or not. Uh, so, and I don't know this information. So looking at the history of the Nishigak River and counting these fish, it seems like there's more, well, we know there's more and more smaller fish. Are there more jacks now than there were 20, 30, 40 years ago? And are those being counted the same as adults or are we just counting adults? It's probably a really simple Silly question that I, I, I guess I don't know. Um, so yeah, so are, are, are we just counting adults at the uh, uh, sonar or are we counting all Chinook salmon? Right, so um, in, in some places in Alaska, especially in Southeast, I think they do differentiate between jacks and large salmon. We don't do that on the Nushigak. It's all kind of baked into the escapement goal. And of course, yes, we've heard of, of the smaller, a lot more smaller fish coming through um, and not, not as many of the large kings. But right now we haven't done, we haven't looked at our data really to, to, to figure that out. Um, and we, Jason and I and Lee were having that conversation just the other day about needing to utilize our data better. Um, but like I said, unfortunately, kings have been an afterthought for over a hundred years. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I'd, I'll add to that too, uh, Justin, to kind of get at the, the jack number in the in the sonar count is that it's it's highly dependent on the apportionment as well. So you know, if they're catching the jacks and the apportionment, they're going to be counted on the sonar. If if they're not, they aren't. So. Um, it comes down to, and they, they fish a suite of nets, so they'll fish various mesh sizes, and 
it comes down to whether they're captured in the apportionment or not. You know, if they're using a bigger mesh size and there's a slug of jacks that just pass through and they don't get hit in the net, they won't get counted as kings because they weren't apportioned. But, you know, conversely, if you, if you catch more than a higher proportion, then they'll get apportioned at a higher proportion. So, um, you know, it, it really is dependent on that apportionment fishery, what gets actually enumerated as kings. And I, and I assume when you're, when you are capturing any kind of king army, are you, are you recording size and, and so on? So you can look back at, at that data and say, okay, in 2020, this was our average size. This is that kind of thing. And totally understand, I totally see what you're saying. Cause if you have a bunch of small kings that just aren't going through the nets, then that doesn't really matter. But, uh, but yeah, so, so, you, so you could hypothetically look through the data that you have because you do record size. Correct. And that's what Tim was talking about with better utilizing our data is going back through these data sets and building histograms of size at, you know, different dates. So, you know, are larger fish moving later in the season or earlier in the season? Is it front loaded with jacks? I mean, our observations tell us yes. I mean, we've all been out on the river and we see that, but we need to go back through our data and, and use it better and, and put together some some graphs that that will show that um, and inform us and, and you guys. It's, it's something we're jumping into and looking into for sure. Yeah, uh, Bob, you might be able to speak to this because you've been on the river sport fishing for a long time. Have you seen uh, an increase, not just smaller adult kings, but have you seen an increase in, in the smaller jacks or has there always been a lot of the, you know, really small jacks mixed up? There, there's so, always been a lot of the, the, it's, the river's so healthy that, mm -hmm. and the ocean's been healthy that there always, there always has been a lot of those. Mm -hmm. And they always, they always, Typically, they've always led the bigger fish. You know, you'll get a little shot of those, and you'll get another run. Pretty normal, but yeah, lots and lots of jacks. At my place, on the wall, you'll find a plaque. A plaque is probably two feet by two feet. I mean, it's pretty substantial, and it has these little placards on it. And it's specifically for the 40-inch club people. So each year since I've had this place, so, you know, call me the newcomer, right? So for the last four years, we've had uh, probably four to six 40 inch fish. Not, not a lot, but you know, it, when you have it, it, it's a substantial event. And so we put those people's name up on this little plaque with the year it happened, not the date, but the year. When I recall, listen, uh, just thinking about what took place, is there's usually a couple in their solstice window, summer solstice window, uh, which is when I used to come up as a client and I bought the whole camp for the 12 seats that were available and then I filled them. Uh, wounded warrior people and you know other people I, I came up with. And then uh, you know later when I owned it, um, that week other people have caught those substantially bigger fish but the majority of the 40 inch fish come in the second or third week of uh, July just about the time Rob's shutting down and so you know when the, when the sport fishing camps are only on the river for 30 days and they have to set up and they have to tear down and so you know they're up fishing for just shy of 30 days just about the time the, the guys are shutting down their camps, that's when the big hogs are coming through. And, you know, that is when those big fish come through. It's like the third week, second to third week in, in July, and they're big. Yeah, Pete, I could totally agree with that from our perspective, because we typically fish through July 14, and most camps are packing up by the 4th of July or 6, and then they're gone. And some of those that from about that time frame to when we finish up has been historically some of my favorite times because a lot less volume, but a lot big average size. So we make those same observations at our camp. I just want to comment that Pete's 40 inch club is a catch and release program, by the way. Well, it is a catch and release program. You get your name on the wall if and when it's back in the water to make other 40 inch fish. That's, that's one of our goals is collectively to come together as sport camps 
and make it hopefully either a slot limit so it's enforced or at least a collective volunteering program where we are trying to put those big fish back in the water. So. Talk to the client of the canneries and we kind of back into this by, so we're on fishing rods and, and so we're taking them one at a time, whatever. But the, the commercial guys, they have these, the magnitude of fish and bycatch that are going into these canneries. If you, if we can talk about who's buying those fish, perhaps we can also talk then about who's out in the ocean that comes from those countries that are buying the magnitude. So uh, I'm just going to say, um, and this is an assumption, okay? It's not, this is not a fact. Let's just say that Japan is buying the fish and they're buying the majority of the fish. If they are, I wonder if there are Japanese fishing vessels out in the ocean in the, the larger, um, beyond Bristol Bay, out in the Bering Sea, that are swooping up and, and pulling in our fish. And, and if that's the case, is there any knowledge of that, that kind of thing? Not necessarily Jeff, it could be Russian or whatever, but, but is that what's happening? Um, so I'll take a step at this. So <laughs> there, you know, since Magnus and Stevens, there, there's not really been any, any foreign countries fishing in a lot in US territorial waters. So 200 mile EEZ, right? Um, you know, historically there was these high seas drift gillnet fishing operations, uh, a lot of, you know, Korean, uh, Russian, some Japanese, I, I think some, you know, Poland actually was a big high seas drift fleet, I think, but that's largely been outlawed. And so, so there's really not, I mean, you know, there's always going to be some pirates out there that, that try and do that kind of stuff. But in general, that's not a thing so much anymore. Okay. And as far as king salmon, they're, they're more of a hassle than anything else for the processors in Bristol Bay. Uh, they're, Bristol Bay is about sockeye salmon. That's what they, their machines are set to process. And so dealing with king salmon is a hassle. Um, especially if, if they're big kings, they won't even go through the fish pumps. They'll get chopped up in the fish pumps, so they have to deal with them separately. There's a few companies, you know, like Copper River, I think, that is a little bit better able to handle kings. And, and I heard that there's some, you know, uh, some smaller processors that will take the kings from the bigger processors um, and, and do them separately but for the most part they they freeze them and once they're frozen they're just not as marketable which i don't understand because i mean i eat frozen kings and they're delicious <laughs> you know but for some reason it, it's a volume thing and they just the processors don't make any money off kings they're a hassle i'd, I'd like to add just a little bit to that um, some historical data we kind of jumped by and uh, the talking to village elders and people the two times in history that the king salmon run was lower than it is now and that was about 1960 and 1960 the run was just nearly gone and Alaska became a state and the um, Japanese were pushed out of the mouth of the Nishigak and allowed the run that we know the run rebounded rebounded tremendously Another time, I believe the data shows that 1977 was the lowest sonar that for kings, and you know the insonification numbers aren't accurate, but they're indexes. And in 1977, we had a really, really, really low number. 1976, we enacted our 200 mile limit and outlawed the the uh, long line fishing, the the things we all know went bad, and the run rebounded tremendously. Um, so we've, we've got a declining run again. We really know it's. I don't know, we shouldn't say that. We, we, it appears that as a result of overfishing. Um, the, some of the data from the, you know, there's observers in the boats on the Bering Sea side that say that the, and genetically the number of Nishigak fish that are caught on the Bering Sea side are really, really, really limited, a number that doesn't even matter. On the Gulf side, I, I have not ever seen any data of the um, uh, bycatch in, 
in the deep water, cold water, but that, that could, be a, could be an effect. Um, but just to tie that together a little bit, REN declining, two times in history where the REN declined significantly, the solutions are about adjusting the fishing, um, the insonification is a difficult number, it's a good index that, you know, the, the managers work their tail off to get the fish up river. But anyway, just a little historical data to kind of get us up to where we are now. And I, I was going to interject that earlier. I just didn't get a chance. So I thought I should throw that out. Thanks, Bob. So we've got impacts from all these user groups that we can all identify. Um, can anyone really speak about the impact from the subsistence side? Bob, is that something you're more familiar with or? I don't, I don't think, I mean, I know people that, I mean, everybody knows people that subsistence fish and that the, the data that we have doesn't tell us that it's really any different than it has been. You know, I think somewhere along the line, someone mentioned that, you know, what the size of the wren doesn't really change the harvest, the, uh, unless there's a directed king fishery for uh, commercial, but the uh, subsistence fishery just generally takes the same amount of fish as our, our sport group has taken the same amount of fish. Um, we're, we're really efficient at that. We intercept a lot of fish. Well, wouldn't our sport guys bring in less fish when we get to catch and release? Num uh, hand those hand those, to those us? Catch, and re catch and release um, situations are always unfortunately late in the season and the biological impact is pretty minimal when, you, when we're talking about people packing up on the 4th of July, their camps and moving on and those um, two fish adjustment or one fish adjustment or daily fish adjustment happens so late in the season that it doesn't have a very big biological impact. Yeah, and as, and as Jason mentioned earlier, the harvest, the har sport harvest stay about the same. It's just the amount of actual catching that's taking place. So if people are spending four days on the river, they're gonna keep they're four, gonna take their, they're gonna take their, their four fish regardless, but they may not be catching a lot of other fish you know, during that trip. What can be done, um, Tim or Lee, to to encourage the commercial fishermen if if taking for taking for uh, a fact or a truth uh, what Tim said a little bit ago about uh, kings being a bycatch and there being no value essentially and it being a nuisance, what can be done? to uh, encourage them to get put back. Dump them they, over. They, many of them do. Yeah. I've talked to many fishermen who are very concerned about king salmon. And they, if the fish is still alive, they will try and release it if, if they think it's going to survive. But unfortunately, you know, kings get, you know, they're fishing long nets. The kings get wrapped up in the net. And by the time they get it to the boat, it's clear it's not going to survive. So, you know, they don't want to, throw a dead fish back sure. um but yeah, they do the, they do try yeah and I'll, I'll echo what tim said i know uh, quite a few commercial fishermen myself here in town that have a personal ethic and if they see a good looking big king they'll they'll throw it back here just to try and get it in the water but you know um net net marking is is rough on these fish so um you know i i if you have a fish that's been tangled in that net for a little while and you can tell it's been roughed up there's you know, I, we don't really have a number for the survival on that, you know, but it's, it's probably not great, you know, and you guys have all seen net marked fish in the river. So it's something that they do get through and they do keep moving. But, um, you know, another question is spawning success when you have a fish that's heavily net marked. So they might make it, but they might have less spawning success. Um, we also don't really have any way of quantifying that either. Lee, that's a great point because I can honestly say in our observation, come around July timeframe, it's it's like 95% of them are net marked up. And it, it's significantly high from our observation. Some days, not so much. It seems like you get an unmolested run, but really by the time July rolls around, majority of the fish have some markings from nets on them. And so that, that might be an important aspect that isn't considered is how, do they survive and what is and how, you know, Obviously, it, it affects to some degree. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I have some some personal data that shows that net marked fish are making it to the spawning grounds. When we did the catch and release mortality study, uh, every fish that was caught and tagged had extensive notes on condition, and several of them later in the season that we were tagging were net marked. Um, 
I was up on the spawning grounds flying surveys and we found some of those fish up there. And like I said, that doesn't say anything about the success that fish was having on the spawning grounds, but marked fish do make it up there. Um, you know, but I would, pr I would echo what, what you're saying as far as, you know, it's by the later in the season, it, you do notice quite a few net mark fish up there. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if we, if we look at other fish that we see a lot of, right. So you see, you see sockeye salmon that get caught and you see if, you know, they're all banged up and they've got white heads. You don't see those, you don't see shoals of white headed sockeye spawning in the, the late summer. You see relatively clean fish spawning in, uh, and, and so, the, so there is some drop factor there that's that's taking place in the system. And and when I, I leave the, the Nunchi, I can go back to the Naknek, and it's a very different system, much shorter, you know, clear water. And you know, we have a lot of net mark fish. And by the time those fish start to spawn in in late August, you're looking at you can see them in the river. You're floating over them, um, and you you're seeing very few fish on the spawning beds that are actually net marked. So whether those fish are ones that weren't net marked as bad and they've been able to make it, but it's, there's certainly just the, the evidence that we see, again, it's really small. We're just looking at it. We don't have any data, but just looking at what's actually on the spawning grounds are fish, uh, you know, when they're spawning that aren't nearly as, as beat up as the ones that we're seeing come up. Uh, and then I guess just one more thing just to just pile on for just conversation that I don't believe we have any data on is uh, for the commercial fishermen that that do have a king in, in their net um, that that drops out, you know, especially on the bigger kings, how do we quantify that and understand that long term when you have a fish that drops out of a net? I mean, I, I've commercial fished out there and we'd have this big, beautiful king and we're just pulling it over the back of the boat and it falls out and it's been in there and it's still alive and it's but it's worn out. And then meanwhile, you have more nets, you know, next to it. And so there is some some sort of uh, thing going on there, and then I guess the third thing that I would just bring up with that is, as we as we see more and more smaller king salmon. So I was on, on the Nutshack last year, and we kept numerous king salmon under 28 inches that were females. Um, and they're so they're getting smaller and smaller. These you know spawning females, and as they get smaller and smaller, do we need to start worrying about them? getting caught in sockeye gear more because now mesh size is not going to, uh, you know, they're going to be more and more getting caught. But then as we saw last year, there just weren't very many Chinook harvested in nets at all, even though they had the smaller size. Maybe that's because fishermen are fishing smaller sockeye gear because their sockeye are significantly smaller too. So it might be playing a factor, but just uh, more food for thought in the conversation. We know what they do in the river, right? They're on the sides of the river, the sockeye. I'm talking about so so and the kings go up the channel we know that from the 2019 heat wave that we had because there were plenty of kings that went up the river um tommy tucker he told me that up in the spawning grounds there there were a ton of fish of all species so i i wonder uh, out in the bay is, is there a some sort of channel that the kings run through So, you know, they, they're everywhere. I mean, there's different channels. There's several different channels in the bay. There's lots of sandbars. So the fishermen fish all across the bay and they fish on the edge of the sandbars. And um, it depends on which ways the wind, the wind's blowing and all these other things. So it, it's, there's no, no way I can think of to, to, like cut out just segments of the bay to protect kings, if if that's where you're going, I guess. It it's more of a question, not a not a statement, because you know we don't. What we know is there's lots and lots of fish, and they come in the river, and we know that the the chum, and the the pink and the sockeye are hugging the banks. We know that. You can stand up and look down and see them. The kings, uh, they're sort of in that vicinity, but they're more in the middle. And certainly during the, the hot water, the, when it was hot, they were in the deepest water they could find uh, in whatever holes and whatever 
uh, deep water they could find. And, and I hope we never have a 2019 again. You know, hope it's, you know, the 100 year heat wave uh, problem because it was a real problem. But I'm wondering if in the Bay, they come in in some manner uh, that, you know, there's a line of just the king. And I wonder if the, the, the nets, the commercial nets that are trying to harvest the sockeye are allowing that escape because of the way the nets are, are laid. I guess that's kind of, it's just in the back of my mind uh, of how, how those nets are laid out in what fashion in the bay uh, to, to let those kings migrate. Yeah, there was 800 boats in the district last year fishing. They're, they're everywhere. Yeah, it seems like like one of the biggest factors for 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 big king harvest has so much to do with with soak time. If you have a lot of sockeye and it's filling up the net and you're and you're not soaking your your net for very long, then you're catching less kings. If there's not as I mean, there's just there's there's so many factors: weather, wind, you know, all this stuff going on that seems to that seems to play a larger factor than where the nets are. Because like like Bob said, there's nets everywhere. I have one question on an observation from 2019. Um, obviously, we remember how warm the water was, how low the water was. We all went fishing on the lowest part of the river during the floods because the fish would come in with the flood or with the tide and then they would go back out. The water was just the conditions weren't such that very few would continue on upriver. And so we just kind of saw that pattern, particularly in the July time frame, early July and on. Um, then as we were just doing work and other things out and about, we did notice fish moving either uh, at first light or what, what, what first light we have or after most everybody's off the river when it got darker, a little cooler. So we have some physical observations that fish were moving. We saw fish moving in 19. They had no desire to bite anything. So our catch rate was way down, but we saw fish. So we know fish came in and came through and came up, but we did see a lot of fish coming in and going out on the lower end of the river. Do you guys have any knowledge of when they do flush in and out like that? I mean, do they, how far about do they go back out? Do they just kind of hang around between Dillingham and the Bay until the next time? Uh, I know that no, there's no data on it, but does anybody have heard or, or maybe have any thoughts on, on that particular so scenario? I've, I've got some just interesting spot observations from our catch and release mortality study when we were uh, radio tagging fish on the river and, um, you know, when you're talking about runs of this size, you know, 300 fish is such a small sample size that it could be an anomaly or it could happen more than, than we think. But we did have a fish that was tagged uh, right there by Jake's camp. And you guys mm -hmm. are familiar with where that is. Um, and then it was caught and returned to us by a commercial fish on the, the outer line of the district like it was... Wow the net going outward from the report from the fishermen, like it was headed toward knack knack or something like that. So um, there is wow. some number of fish we, we can't quantify, but uh, there are some number of fish that come as far as we know, all the way up into the fresh water there, you know, below the sonar and then can wash all the way back out into the district. So um, how prevalent that is, I don't know, but that was one spot observation. So it's, um, it's highly variable. And like you said, in 19, we did notice fish were holding down there at Black Point. We were getting reports from you guys on the river. Uh, we had our crews checking on things and that was what was being seen. And then, um, like you said, there's, we can't, we don't have any numbers on this, but there is a likelihood that fish were moving more at night based on temperature. Um, just a, you know, just enough, just a one or two degree temperature change from that day to night swing could be enough to move fish. But uh, again, we don't have numbers on that. So. Interesting. I, I think certainly wind makes a difference. You know, fish will mill back and forth. If, when it's not windy, the counts drop off and, and the fish are, then then we'll get a big wind event. And I remember there was one year we had 70,000 fish go up in one day. And um, so there's all these other factors that who, who knows what makes those fish do what they do. But wind <laughs> is a definitely, definitely 
something that pushes the fish. And, and I think there's a lot of milling that happens when there's no wind. And of course, 2019 was flat calm. Yeah. All right. Bob, are you ready to share with us some of the solutions that have been put on the table? Um, I think you identified 14 points that are in, in discussion. And Chair, don't shoot the messenger here. This is uh, the um, Nishigak Advisory Council, the group of sport fish, subsistence fish, and commercial fish. And, it's, and as I mentioned, it's led by some uh, prior uh, department uh, guys. And it's the depart BBSRI, I'm not sure if everybody's aware, is funded by uh, BBNA, BBNC, um, because they're very concerned about the fish. And that's also where, Tim, where you said some of that funding, industry funding is coming from to help fisheries. Um, the, uh, I'll, just, I'll just run through them quickly and we can you know, jump in and out of them. And, and the, these are all not really ratified. These are things that were, that were gathered and gathered and gathered and they keep being vetted and vetted and vetted. And so it'll, it'll be a little jumping around here. Uh, number one is modify the Wood River trigger. And um, the current Wood River trigger is 100,000 fish. And that was developed with much smaller sockeye runs. And the, the simplification of it is that uh, having a larger trigger will allow the managers to keep the, the nets out a little bit longer and allow at the time the kings are coming in late June when the peak historically those peak king numbers are coming that would allow more kings in river to get them up to the spawning grounds. Uh, and if I go longer than that any of these will take forever so I'll, I'll uh, move through them a little quicker. Um, number two is um, not this is a, a difficult and been talked about much and I, I won't is the escapement of priority priority over allocation, and that's really gone nowhere in committee. Um, restricting the mesh size, number three, restricting the mesh size for the sockeye. There's a lot of studies done on that. BBSRI is working on that. Um, and the idea would be to be able to exploit the sockeye quicker, get more fish in the, in the nets, in the boats, and allow the managers to uh, manage the, the fish, have time when the, the nets are out of the river to allow king escapement. Uh, Avoid closure. That, and this, um, Brian Kraft really started this committee a couple years ago um, to help the sport fishermen to avoid sport fish closure when possible. Um, having the trigger numbers lower, um, changing uh, uh, to catch a release when possible to allow the, we all know that the, the sport fish camps, when fishing gets shut off in the middle, it costs everybody a ton of money. You can't make any money when you've mobilized, you've got the fuel, your guides, your everything's happened and all of a sudden you don't have any revenue. And so the idea originally a long time ago was to talk about sport fishing and keep our lines in the water, keep opportunity. And so that's, that's being discussed. Um, and this is, I don't think this is even a real uh, point, but it's been talked about a lot in committee is a directed commercial king fishery when a clear surplus. That's always been done. The managers have always had the ability to do that. We just haven't had a, a surplus to do that for a long time. Um, modify and make the sport fishery more conservative. And that leads to um, how can the sport fishermen get some more fish up the river? If we're harvesting six, 7,000, 10,000 fish in a year, the um, something that's on the table as a recommendation would be um, still four fish, but only one fish kept over 28 inches. We have a surplus of those jacks and there's a lot of discussion about that, but it would be um, restricting the, the fish that are kept to, to one mature fish for the sport fishermen. Um, clarifying um, the subsistence area beyond the Nishigak drainage. Um, and that's revising the way the plan reads now um, to the waters above the district and the Wood River up to the Red Bluff. There's some, some uh, adjustment to that, that, that and that has been, that's, really lukewarm among the committee, doesn't seem to make a big difference to anybody. Um, and then the, a lower trigger for subsistence fishery restrictions as with sport fish and standardize the subsistence restrictions um, to three days a week or every other day or so, just to allow more fish up the river, keep the nets out a little longer. Um, 10 is explicit language to manage the large sockeye runs to the upper half of the escapement goal range. That would go back to um, 
al allowing more escapement early when we know the bulk of the kings are coming to get them up the up the rivers. Uh, and and modify the this was brought up by a, a couple commercial guys um, modify the transfer period in the commercial fishery to mitigate early season fleet dynamics and that would mean right now that there's a, a 48 hour out of water when you leave the Nishigak district um, or or changing any districts for fishing um, a 72 hour was brought up and that would maybe not put so many boats in the Nushigak district to start with when the when the fishing's hot, maybe some people would choose other places. It's a little bit lukewarm, but that has has some steam as a recommendation. Um, and then, a, you know, the, a pretty broad brush statement is that there's all kinds of ideas about this and and it would be reduce or mitigate continuous fishing in the commercial fishery. When um, the, the sockeye show up, and the kings are up and the triggers have been met, the, the nets stay in. And when the, the, the nets are in for four tides, um, we're getting a lot of bycatch. Um, and then an another um, thing that was brought up, and this, this has a lot of, everybody's nodding their head, head on this and um, is mandating the use of a district test fishery to know wh whether we should be fishing, the commercial should be fishing or not. Um, by, by having fish in the river and that if there's kings coming and we're catching just kings or a really low exploita exploita exploitation numbers happening, that test boat would say, yeah, fish, no, don't fish. It would give the managers some more tools whether or not to fish. So that's a real quick overview. I can answer questions or give clarification on any of those that anybody has quite. It's a 3000 word document that I just skimmed over in a minute and a half. <laughs> well done. For, for me, you know, when I think about solutions, I, I, we all have to kind of agree on a cause, but there's so many different causes. We're looking at solutions from all angles, right? So- Yeah, and, and I think these, these solutions are to get more fish up river, you know, to increase the number of fish that are spawning. Um, I, we've all seen it. We've all been in the river dip, different amounts of times and the, it, it's shrinking. And we're definitely in a dip, difficult time. You know, we, we can't control size, we can't control ocean conditions, but we can surely get some more fish up the river. Um, I was making some notes when we were, we were talking and if we had um, 40,000 fish past the sonar um, last year, we know that there was about a 20,000 bycatch um, uh, commercially, you know, 12,000 subsistence, couple thousand with a 6% mortality on interception. And last year's not a good number, go, go to a five-year average and a couple thousand mortality based on the interception rate. Um, you know, over, and then um, we don't have any data on home pack, the fish that, that don't see the, um, the canneries, the freezer plants, and we don't have any real data on dropout. And so maybe we're harvesting more fish or killing more fish than the, that are actually getting by the sonar. Um, so I, we're, we're over exploiting the kings and I think the, the user groups that I've been talking to with the subsistence, the commercial, the sport, realize that everybody says, hey, we got to do something. And so it's just time for, you know, ev everybody to help. And I think that there's some momentum building on that. There's nobody saying, oh, no, we can't do anything different. Oh, no, that people are saying, yeah, we, we can do some things differently. So maybe our group is... Destined for talking about what sporties can do to help. Yeah, and that's the the committee is is you know beat the, the internal ideas to death and come down to these dozen or so ideas. The the committee is, is just starved for outside ideas. What can be done? What can be proposed? Who's willing to do what? So that I can take that anything anybody has here back to the committee. Were you referring to BBRSI? Did I write that down right? Bristol Bay Science and Research Institute is actually funded by. BBEDC, Bristol Bay Economic Development there you go. Corporation, which is a CDQ group, um, which is not funded at all by BBNA or BBNC. So BBSRI. Correct. And tell me slowly what that is, Bristol Bay. Science and Research Institute. And BBSRI has set up, they're the, they, they have formed a, a group called 
BBFC, the Bristol Bay Funding Collaborative. Basically, they collect money from different industry groups, the BBRSDA, the Bristol Bay Regional Seafood Development Association, which is the drift fishermen of Bristol Bay who voted themselves a 1% tax. And, and they're a big contributor. Uh, the processors, uh, individuals, like the North, the, the, some of the, the shipping companies. BBFC takes money from all these entities and BBSRI matches that money and the money is used to fund different projects in Bristol Bay, whether it's the, our, our port molar test boat, uh, commercial catch sampling in 2018, 2018 and 2019, it was funding sonar operation into August. Well, there's all these different things, but that's the $800,000 I was talking about that they contribute to uh, help with the management of the Bristol Bay fishery. I'm a, a member, but not a fisherman anymore of Kenai River Sport Fishing Association, KRSA. Monies that you're donating uh, are to help the sport fishery and let them be a mouthpiece back to, uh, I'm guessing as a lobbyist, back to the legislative body uh, and just to as a collection point of ideas from the various entities that are involved in sport fishing, right? Or that might affect it. Could be the, uh, the anglers themselves, could be the lodge owners, could be independent guides, could be, you know, guys like Jason who can oversee all this kind of stuff. Um, it's, a, it's a private association. So it's just thinking, what would it take uh, what would it take to create something like that for Bristol Bay? Uh, the Bristol Bay Sport Fishing Association, uh, BBSFA, um, is, it would be easy enough to set up, you know, but it has to have the right constituency. It has to be a partnership, I think, of uh, government, of, uh, of those of us that are uh, lodge owners, whether we're camp or, or lodge, and whether we're part-time or full-time, whether we're fly in, you know, uh, to the river and have a boat on the side of the river, uh, because that's how we do it, and then fly back out at the end of the day. It doesn't really matter. I think that the constituency needs to come together. The question is, if you, if that were to occur, um, could we do something with it collectively? Could we do something with it that would be helpful and not just another time consumer in our day? You know, if we layered it with membership, you know, where we had uh, anglers, right? The people that come and visit my camp and visit Rob's camp and, and all, you know, the different camps and whatnot. If there was a portal essentially to, to allow them to put their dollars like I did over at Kenai River Sports Fishing and, and give a couple hundred dollars a year uh, or as they wanted to, to the cause. Guide camps, you know, guides have, would be uh, another layer. Owners might be a layer. And then the, you know, the wrapper, you know, others. So I just throw it out there because uh, there's no reason to set something up if it's just a, a black hole or a, or a bad idea. But if it's an idea that's worth pursuing, uh, I'm not interested in running it, but I am interested in setting the damn thing up so that we get it going. I run too many companies as it is now. The idea, Pete, would be to have representation uh, eventually on the fish board because Jason and Tim and you guys, that's great. Isn't that where the allocation decisions are made? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's correct, Rob. Yeah, and you know, in, in terms of our role in, in these types of groups, we would be here to provide information to you and, and you know, to help with the process in terms of getting through to the Board of Fish and getting proposals put together. But that would be 
pretty much the department's role would be to, you know, we would, we'd be willing to provide whatever data or information that you need. Like the proposal of a slot limit fish, you know, to help with the size, um, when the next time our cycle comes up, is that a, is that a realistic thing to consider from the sport fishing side so that our big fish, uh, more people are more, are basically forced to let go of those bigger fish for our spawning genetics for, you know, because we want more big fish. Uh, is that something that can be done easily or do you see a problem with something like that? It's certainly something that can be brought before the board. I mean, any one of you or, or all of you collectively can come together and, and put together a proposal and, and put it into the board. And we would certainly provide info, data, and we would, you know, our role would be to look over them for you if you wanted us to just take a look at the formatting and things like that and, and help you guys put together the proposal. Um, you know, we would do that in a neutral kind of way because obviously we would have our staff comments later and we would have our internal discussions between divisions about what we feel on these on these proposals. But um, generally, when they come from the user group and they're well supported, and um, you know the the board tends to receive that kind of stuff well, so it's uh, it's certainly something that uh, could be looked into. Has a slot limit been on the table for this? Um, it, you know, it's something that's that's come up in discussion. You know, we've we've had discussion internally about its effectiveness. Um, we've had users mention it as a possibility too. So it's um, certainly been floating around out there. Yeah, is there is there any evidence that that shows that that has been successful in, in other places? You know, I, I'll if Jason has any input on that, I'd let him speak up. But I, I don't off the top of my head head have any examples um, ready to go. I, I do know that it's used in other species that I am familiar with. I know that it's a big component of the sturgeon sport fishery down in California, which is one that I was heavily involved with, uh, you know, where I come from. But uh, so it, it has some merits. It certainly exists in other places for other species. Um, it's it's you know a management tool that we could discuss for for sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to add. I, you know, I, I think it has worked in some places, but I think, and, and it's worth considering here, you, you would put more big fish on the spawning grounds if you were releasing all of them. And um, I do think that this is such a black box right now. I, I would hesitate to say it's going to really benefit things. I don't know. That being said, it's, it doesn't mean don't bring that to the board. I mean, if, if that's something that people feel strongly are, is going to help, then I would bring it there. And, and as Lee mentioned, we're, we're looking into that a little more as, as one of the options for, for addressing this. Um, one thing that is particularly special about the Nushagak is your ability to catch and release uh, well past your harvest. And so one thing I've observed is on certain rivers, uh, like the Kenai, who have had like a longer uh, problem, a longer identified problem with the king and especially their larger king um, strain. They have a proactive agencies, including they utilize our magazine to, to as a mouthpiece, um, but they're really strong on the catch and release technique and behavior and enforcing that like with groups like Fish for the Future. Again, we don't really need another organization, but can we, I feel that as a someone who's fished the Nush plenty of times I've seen um, kind of a gamut of catch and release effort. In other words, um, not handled with care as much as I would have liked to see when the fish are released on the sport side. There's just like, you know, a different mentality. I almost feel like it's a changing mentality among anglers and you've got your old school, don't care, <laughs> throw it back. And you've got your very careful, you know, angler who is very conscious of the future, who is, you know, doing everything they can. So uh, technique for catch and release is a really important aspect to consider. It can't just be catch and release if the fish is banging its head along the side of the boat. So I wonder if there's something we can do collectively to educate or enforce. I, I'm not, I'm not sure how it would work. I just want to say, it's like, I think that's, that's awesome. That, and there's definitely some mishandling that goes on, but in the last couple of years, I don't know many, there's not that many guides that are even having the opportunity to release an adult fish. Uh, there's been so few adults that everyone's fishing all day to just get 
their keepers for their boat. So the majority of the fish that are being released are smaller jacks or you know slot size fish. So I think it's a it's a great it's it'd be great because it's just it's better for the overall angling hole if people respect every fish that they catch. But uh, but we also need to realize that there's like there's a huge problem that we're just not catching very many adults. I mean I got a fish all last season and like I mean it was it was amazing. We caught a lot of fish with no one around, but if you would go catch 50, you were really, really, really fortunate if you were able to keep four fish over 28 inches of those 50. And, and so there's, I think a you know, bigger problem at, at play than, I don't know. I just, I just don't feel like in the last few years, there's been a lot of opportunity to even release adult fish, but if that's something that we want to consider doing and consider a slot limit, then I think that would be definitely uh, something that would be important for sure. But there's a bigger issue at hand. Right, so solutions. Yeah. So yeah. the problem is that not enough fish are getting up the river. One of, one of the ways as a manager that I see we could get more fish up the river is using the Wood River Special Harvest Area. The Wood River Special Harvest Area was originally designed to protect coho salmon. It's been used multiple times to protect Nushigak sockeye salmon. Why can't it be used to protect Nushigak king salmon? Well, the bottom line is because it's not been approved by the Board of Fish yet. I worked with my neighbor who was very concerned about Nushigak kings. I got him, I helped him write the proposal. We, he submitted it in 2009. And unfortunately, he, he wasn't able to speak eloquently to it and it got, it, it got shuffled in with a bunch of other river proposals and people didn't understand it and it, it just got passed by. This last fall, I again, I, I wrote an uh, agenda change request, an ACR. I, I passed it on to my bosses and ultimately the decision was made in the upper levels of the department not to submit that to the Board of Fish. But I think uh, a properly you know, it's a very controversial issue. It's not going to get a lot of support from commercial fishermen, but I think if it's worded properly, um, a, a way to protect Nushigat Kings, especially in that, that week in June, you know, that first, the 20th to the 27th of June, if, if we can somehow reduce commercial fishing in the district by using the Wood River Special Harvest Area, we could protect a lot of kings. And that's my solution. Yeah, we've met a lot of opposition with that at, at our level from the commercial guys. And so, it, you know, it, it, and the idea has been brought up several times and it's warming up, but that would be another recommendation in our arsenal. I absolutely agree with you. And, and many other people do. You've conveyed that to a lot of people who agree with you. And so it's a matter of, you know, getting it to the board in a proper way to make it work. I think it could be huge. I, I think so too. And, and the way I have it structured, I actually, I think a, a tiered, I call it a tiered plan where based on, on one year's performance, you know, if, if we fail to meet a escapement goal, whether that's the 95,000 in river goal or the 55,000 lower end goal, it would trigger a more restrictive uh, environment the subsequent year. And and if we did meet the goals, then we wouldn't have to be as restrictive. And, and I have a kind of a two, like there's three years, there's year zero where everything's great and there's no pre-existing restrictions. In year one, there's some pre-existing restrictions. For example, the Wood River trigger that you talk about and, and, and making that a higher number or a, a, a more uh, conservative trigger. And then in year two, when you you've definitely failed to meet either meet the in river goal for two years in a row or meet the, failed to meet the lower end of the goal, then then this Wood River option would be on the table. So it wouldn't be on the table every year. That that makes it a little bit more appealing to uh, the commercial fishermen, but it's not hanging over their head every year as long as we're making the escaping goal. It, it's complicated, you know, and and not nobody wants to give up anything, but 
the fact of the matter is, if nobody gives up anything, we're not going to solve this problem. Uh, I think totally uh, the bridge is, is the critical aspect of it. You know, again, a lot of this seems to, as we all know, it always focuses on the data. And so the quality of the data is what is, to me, imperative. And, um, and so, you know, I, I, I want to lean on our counterparts, Lee and Jason and Tim on providing us that list of what we need to substantiate or validate the data even better since those are what are used in order as the management tool for us. And, you know, again, so back to your BBSFA, yeah, uh, it, I don't know. I don't know if you guys would even, if Fishing Game would even be allowed to be a part of it, you know, uh, which is what obviously uh, w would be a, a benefit from that aspect, but I just don't know that they would be allowed to do that. Um, but yet, like you guys already said, you're there, you can provide all the data, all that kind of information in the event to help us uh, with the tool and whether it being proposals or whatnot. But just, just in listening to a lot of this, I wanna focus on the data. If the data is what we use to make decisions, then I wanna make the data as good as it can be, as best as it can be, and, and fill in the gap with what we can provide from boots on the ground or in the field to support what's coming through the counters. And so, I'm hoping that at the end of the discussion that somehow we can get a list from you guys of these are the things that we need. These are the observations we like to see if you can provide it. This is how often, this is for what. And, and I think all that would be useful for, particularly for Pete and I, Justin, and I'm sure any other camp that feels they, they got a stake in the game. We used to have uh, these, these log books that we filled out as a guide, you know, the guidebook, the, you know, Reboat had one and we don't do it anymore you have to register your boats with them but that's it and i often wondered what happened to all the i mean it's a big stack of paper that you're turning in i often wondered whatever happened with that stuff but it's not even being done now so uh if we need to make our own uh for you uh for the biologists or, or the, the 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 managers of uh the river Let's do it. You know, it, it's not hard. And the rest of the the camps, I'm sure they'd be all right with it. They're, why not? We. I think. It, I think at one time you guys were sending somebody up to do some yeah. either data recording or measurements of fish or something. Y'all did that for a year or two, didn't y'all? There's a couple yeah. of sport fishing guys that come up. They eat at my so camp. Wow. Yeah, so we, um, you know, we periodically creel the, the river. So we did it in 19. Um, we do it every few years. Um, there's been some discussions maybe about that as a mechanism for, for collecting this data rather than doing um, log books or anything like that. There's, you know, we, we've had some discussion internally about hypothetically, maybe we just do uh, creels on the new Shidak every year. I mean, that could be a better source of that data. And we would have crews that would come by and they would your fish and interview and they'd get CPUE data from you guys as well as doing angler counts. So um, it could end up being a bigger data set than just, um, you know, voluntary data reporting. We could end up with uh, better, better data that way and more data. So, uh, you know, we're certainly discussing that as an option. And, and like you said, you know, you guys have seen our crew up there collecting samples and measuring and counting. So. Well, if you want to be the most effective, then go to the camps where, who are not participating and these guys who are efficient and have internet and are willing to help and are, as I can attest to, highly meticulous, you know, get yourself a Google spreadsheet and give them a line for their lodge, let them put the daily data in and save yourself a bunch of money and time and go search out the other avenues that. Yeah, I mean, for, for data quality and for, you know, just the, the random sampling nature of the way we have to collect data, we would just have to sample everybody. Um, so we would just we would get it that way and and if we're there through the whole season we would be able to sample everyone often enough that our data would be would be solid so it, it would be more efficient to do it that way but i, I think we would have some data quality issues uh, trying to do it like fair enough what beach there's two kids up there and they make the circle every day and they they at the end of the day uh usually at dinner time they swing by my camp and <laughs> feed them and they they uh, take samples and scales and they interview and they 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 are on it i mean they're collecting the data that we i think 
or talking about. Where yeah, does that, that That's correct. That's our that would be our Creo crew. So that would be who would be who would be doing this in the future. And we we have that data. So we we go through, we compare effort levels from what they see to, to past reports. Uh, we compare the size and and I mean we go through that data and compare it to past surveys is basically how we use it to see how the fishery is changing. Um, if you were to make that a year, a, a, you know, an every year thing, it would just make it so that we'd have a bigger, larger data set to work with. Um, Are you not able to do that? Um, you know, it, it, it's mostly a funding thing, it, you know, where we want to account, allocate our resources. I mean, Bristol Bay is a huge area, and so I've got to manage everywhere from Togiak to Ugashik and Egagik and everywhere in between. So, you know, we try and survey as many rivers as we can and get our biggest bang for the buck by doing that. But, um, you, you have know, an idea how much it costs? Um, you know, we... I can crunch numbers and, and have some figures, but you know it it would come down to needing to find some funding for it, essentially, or you know getting some direction from higher above that that's the new direction we want to take with our projects. Um, and there's there's multiple routes, but it, it does kind of come down to a money thing and uh, splitting what the, the resources we do have amongst all the drainages in, in the bay, basically. So so if BBSFA, the not for profit. Bristol Bay Sport Fishing Association wanted to fund those two people. Is that something we could do so that it doesn't come out of your hide and we um, don't get stopped by whoever the management is? Potentially. I mean, there's avenues for public private partnerships and um, I've been involved in those in the past and in other, in other areas working with the state. So um, it would it would be a similar setup, I imagine, to how uh, you know BBSRI helps fund some of the commercial fisheries projects. I don't know much about the mechanisms of setting that stuff up, but um, there's likely some sort of, of roadmap to get there. Could they be contract employees for BBSFA, and the data just comes to you after you establish the criteria? I mean, do they have to work for the fish and game? I, you know, I, I don't know that, that these are all things that could be discussed. I, you know, I, um, I know that, you know, BBSRI in the past has done a lot of their own work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's certainly something where um, if somebody wanted to do this work, we would work with them on project design or, I mean, there's, there's multiple yeah. ways that we could get in and in on this and, and help. So. It's so easy for us camps to take measurements and weights and pull scales and do whatever and put them in bags and freeze them. So I, I think there's, unless there's some kind of contamination issue, I think the collection of the data, the information uh, can be done somewhat easily collectively from camps across the way where people just have to pick up packages. Um, of course, you know, training would be involved and there'd be a few, it's not, I, I I'm oversimplifying it, but I, I do think that, I mean, you know, I'm a biologist, I have a biology background. I mean, I can train people at any of my camps to do whatever the work we need done based on whatever protocols y'all set up. So, uh, so I feel the labor and the effort. And we're, like I said, we're there to help make the data better. It's just a matter of what can we do to make it better since that's the tool we're using to manage the whole system. And it sounded to me like these gentlemen have more of the data of which they need and they need the time and focus to analyze it as well from an earlier discussion. Maybe, maybe that's the thing. Maybe, Jay, uh, Lee, you take your two guys worth of finance uh, funding and you keep it as the data analyst people and we provide the, the, the input people uh, either out of hide, as Rob just pointed out, or uh, through funding from the BBSFA you know, staff who would report back to you and it would be untainted, unfiltered uh, directives that you're giving them. Um, seems like it's not that hard to do that. And and I don't discount uh, what Melissa said a little bit ago about the uh, Google Drive kind of capability where we can jam that stuff in daily and you know you get it real time if that's something you need or want. I mean, there's there's certainly ways that we can incorporate data collected by users. Um, you know, there's I'm not going to be able to promise a lot in this discussion right now, based on the fact that I would have to take what we're talking about 
run it past biometricians and make sure that they're on the same page with the usability of the data or uh, what constraints they might have in collection of that data. Because um, really when it comes down to it, we've got standards when it, when, our, when it comes to data and data use and we have to make sure that we have high quality data. And sometimes that doesn't come down to my decision. The biometricians will say you must collect it in manner A, B, and C to make this data good. So um, I like the ideas and it's certainly something I'm willing to explore more, but I would have to have some further conversations with staff internally. Well, I know it could be good because I've helped Daniel uh, Schindler up on the lake system doing projects up there and we've done data collection for them as well. And so I know they're, they're with the University of Washington, they're not a state agency, but um, uh, so, it, I mean, we've done it before and I know we can do it again. And especially if it's, if it's a good, useful tool for you guys. Yeah, I'd certainly be willing to explore that. Yeah. And a lot of these guys are buddies on the river. So I know like Rob would go around helping a few people with training too. Sorry to volunteer you, Rob. Anyone else have any other questions or anything else that needs to be added? I feel like we've come to a few like next step moments where we have more questions, right? And we can summarize this by email afterwards saying these are th these are the further questions we have you know find out what kind of parameters we have to work with to take action um there's obviously bigger forces at work here i do think tim's idea which he told me about i don't know six months ago if it wasn't a year about the wood river special harvest area is a uh, would benefit us in river and uh, we should try to collectively you know, put that proposal forward. Um, but beyond that, are there any other questions or thoughts that you want to share before we <laughs> wrap this very long and an informative meeting? Everybody good? Just say if, if you need any help or whatever on that, I'm, I'm here, I'm available. Uh, the proposal deadline's been changed to, I think, May 10th. Okay. And the board meeting is going to be, they're still planning on having it next uh, fall. Like uh, they're debating whether it's going to be November, October, December, or whatever, but they're planning on having the Bristol Bay Board of Fish meeting in the fall. And, and you know what? And I'll, I'll go back to my comment about kind of putting in that slot limit. You know, I always, I always hate, I, I really hate to even mention that on one hand, because once it's, once you put something in government, it's kind of there forever. And so um, we can always consider doing when we talk about slot limits on the river, like what the lodges do up on the Wood River systems, where we all collectively catch and release all native species. I know it's probably a, just a general inherent common sense practice, but all the lodges do that. And I think on the river between us three represented here and the network that we know, I think we could probably just network out and start encouraging other camps to do the same, particularly on bigger fish or whatever we think we need to be uh, targeting or helping with. Because like I said, I'm always learning about putting stuff in paper and in the books because sometimes it's really hard to get that back out. But if we can do it in an informal way, I think that might be a good approach as well. That might be a really strong message that we put through BBSFA to all the members. And it's just our collective like approach. I, I like that idea, Rob. I, I really like where you're going there. And, you know, like you said, it, once you put it on paper, it's on paper. And we're in, a, we're in a downturn now. And Bob mentioned there's been other downturns. And, you know, it, it, you, you hate to take drastic action. And then 10, 15 years from now, we're in a situation where we have 200,000 fish up there and we have a slot limit. So it, there's those are certainly things to think about, too. I would like for that to be the worst case scenario. Yeah, I hope we have great. that. I hope we have that problem yeah. again. Yeah, <laughs> sounds great. Good idea. Well, thank you all for spending your time and for caring about the Nishikak and.